Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise in support of the motion. The President's speech marks the formal opening of the Parliament session. The speech itself describes the government's agenda for the rest of the term. The addenda to the speech then lay out the specific programs of each ministry. This is a tradition we inherited from the UK, where the Queen delivers a speech drafted by the elected government, although it's called the Queen's speech. And the speech highlights the government's legislative program. However, our President's speech this year is slightly different. It sets out not only the program for the current term, but also longer term priorities beyond this term of government. The speech took this approach because Parliament is reopening at a special moment in our history. The world situation is very uncertain. The global order, which is based on openness, globalization, and free trade, has come under great pressure. Relations between the big powers, especially the US and China, and also the US and Russia, are under stress. It is not clear whether the institutions and the international rules that have underpinned world peace and security for the last few decades will change. And if they change, there will be significant long-term implications for Singapore. Singapore, too, is at a turning point. We are opening a new chapter after SG50. It will be a new phase of our social and economic development. We have the responsibility and the privilege of reimagining and rebuilding Singapore over the next 50 years and more. We are also going through a significant generational change. A new generation, born long after independence, is coming to the fore with different views and aspirations. We are also in the midst of a political transition with a fourth generation ministers preparing to take over within the next few years. Therefore, it's timely for the government to set out a broader vision, a longer term agenda in the President's speech. I ask the 4G ministers to draft the President's speech because they will have to carry out this agenda, continuing beyond my time as Prime Minister. I gave my inputs and I endorsed what they produced because as PM, I'm still ultimately responsible for the government's agenda. But my main role is to be supportive to help the 4G ministers present and implement the agenda and to see through as much of it as possible while I am PM. Today, I'll speak about five aspects of the President's speech. First, coping with external challenges. Next, growing our economy. Third, ensuring social mobility. Fourth, maintaining social cohesion. And finally, ensuring good politics and leadership. Let me start with the external environment. Globalization, which has delivered growth and stability for many countries, including Singapore, has come under pressure. Countries, particularly in the West, are questioning the benefits of openness and free trade and of the free movement of people. The US has been thus far the champion and sponsor of the post-war international system. They promoted free trade. They opened their own doors to immigrants. They were generous to others, sharing technology and know-how. They spent blood and treasure to maintain global peace. They believed that all this was in their own enlightened self-interest. But now, many Americans no longer believe this, including the Trump administration. They feel that other countries are benefiting more from the global system and benefiting at the expense of the US. 
They want to make sure that the U.S. will always benefit directly, item by item, country by country, and not just generally from upholding a system which is good for everybody and therefore indirectly good for the U.S. So the U.S. has made trade a top issue, especially trade with China. The trade tensions between U.S. and China hurt business, but more broadly, their unilateral and tit-for-tat actions undermine the multilateral trading system. In other words, it's not just the two participants who are affected or the amount of whether it's steel or aluminum or soya beans or cars which is not exported and which can't be traded, but the whole multilateral system, the system of rules which ensures that countries big and small have play on a level playing field, have their place in the sun and can contribute to and benefit from this international network of cooperation and is a system which we have depended upon in Singapore. Therefore, the trade tensions threaten global prosperity, especially for smaller countries like Singapore. The trade disputes can also affect the overall relations between the powers. The US and China are jockeying for position and advantage. The US is still stronger, especially militarily, but China is growing in power, influence, and confidence. Increasingly, the US has to accommodate China. And if there's mutual distrust and rivalry between the two, it is but a small step from a trade agreement, trade disagreement, to a wider and more serious quarrel. The US and China are far from going to war with each other, but it is not clear which way their relations will tilt. If they tilt towards more conflict, it will be bad, be bad not only for the two powers, but for the rest of the world as well. That's obvious. But if relations tilt to the other extreme, and the two powers agree to divide up the world between them and set rules that only benefit them, that would be just as detrimental, especially for small countries which have no say. As a small and open country, Singapore will always be vulnerable to what happens around us. As Ms. Lee Kuan Yew used to say, when elephants fight, the grass suffers, but when they make love, the grass suffers also. <laughs> Therefore, we must be aware of what's happening around us and prepare ourselves for changes and surprises. Close to home, Malaysia saw a historic change last week in its general election. Pakatan Harapan, led by Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, now forms the government. For the first time ever in Malaysia, the AMNO-led Barisan Nasional lost power. This is a momentous development. As Malaysia's closest neighbor, we need to pay close attention to our relationship with them. The two countries have deep historical, economic, and people-to-people -people ties. We hope Malaysia is stable and prosperous. We have enjoyed good relations with Malaysia under the former Prime Minister, Najib Razak, and cooperated on major projects that benefit both sides. We have also worked with Dr. Mahathir and several of his team before. We completed joint projects with Malaysia when Dr. Mahathir was last the Prime Minister, including building the second link at Tuas. And I also know Mr. Anwar Ibrahim well because he was my counterpart when I was Deputy Prime Minister. The expectations of a new Malaysian government are very high, and I think Dr. Mahathir will be very busy in the days to come. But I plan to visit Malaysia on Saturday to meet Dr. Mahathir and to tell him that I look forward to working with him again for mutual benefit. Indonesia is having elections too, local elections this year and national elections the next. 
I have good working relations with President Jokowi, as I did with President Yudhoyono before. I hope we can maintain friendly and productive ties with Indonesia too. Regardless of political cycles or election outcomes, we will work hard on relations with our two neighbours. Their success makes for a more peaceful and prosperous region, and that is good for us. In the President's speech, she spoke about how Singapore must remain a nation of opportunities. This, to me, is the heart of our nation-building journey. Our forefathers came to this land because they sought better lives for themselves and their families. When independence was thrust upon us and the odds were stacked against us, our pioneer generation dug in and slogged to build a nation. Their children and grandchildren took up the torch after them and improved Singapore year by year. This sense of opportunity, of possibility, hope, is the spark that has inspired generations of Singaporeans to dream big and to work hard to realize those dreams. We must always sustain this confidence that we can build a better life for ourselves and future generations of Singaporeans, that we can make tomorrow better than today. Nationally, this means growing our economy, creating new possibilities, and expanding our horizons. Individually, it means improving the life of every Singaporean in a fair and open and a cohesive society. One of the top priorities of the government is therefore to keep the economy growing. We are in a strong position today because our economy has grown steadily for the past 50 years and more. We've enjoyed high growth for much of this half century, even from time to time exceeding 10% per annum. Since independence in 1965, our GDP has grown more than 40 times in real terms. Today, our per capita income is higher than Japan's. We can see it in all our lives. Now that we have become more developed, our growth forecast is moderated to 2 to 4 percent. This has made some people anxious. They worry that their children will not have better lives than they themselves do today. But let me put the numbers in perspective. First, 2 to 4 percent is in fact quite good for a mature economy. South Korea and Taiwan are growing around this rate too. Japan is growing even slower. Second, 2 to 4 percent is just an estimate based on our current stage of economic development. It is not the limit to our efforts or to our ambitions. Individual companies and individual industries can certainly do better, especially if they come up with a new, more innovative product or if they expand into new markets till virgin ground. We are pushing ahead with our economic upgrading. We can see the opportunities. The only question is whether we can seize them. Take, for example, the digital economy. A lot is happening around us. In Indonesia, in Jakarta, the tech scene is vibrant, buzzing with energy and talent. And Indonesia has produced four unicorns, unicorns are not animals, they are companies which have become worth more than $1 billion, and Indonesia has four of them, Gojek, Traveloka, Bukalapa, and Tokopedia. Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia have lively tech sectors too. So if we can build up our own tech sector while connecting with theirs, we will prosper together. We are making good progress also developing frontier technologies in artificial intelligence, in fintech, in advanced manufacturing. We've attracted leading AI researchers and companies to Singapore. NTU has built a reputation as a leading center in AI. 
The Alibaba Group recently opened a research institute on AI together with NTU, which is its first research institute outside China. When I visited Beijing recently, I went to see Didi Chuxing. It's the equivalent of Grab or Uber. And I met some NTU graduates there. And the Didi CTO, Chief Technology Officer, Bob Zhang, told me the graduates are doing very well. So our people are well prepared. In fintech, MAS has developed Singapore to become a fintech hub just within the last two or three years. The right rules, the right encouragement, the right openness, the right light touch, and the flower blossoms. They have green fingers. More than 400 fintech firms are now based here, and so are over 30 innovation labs and research centers set up by MNCs. In advanced manufacturing, ASTAR is collaborating with multinationals, with local companies and universities to develop new technologies in aerospace and precision engineering. For example, we have a joint laboratory with Rolls-Royce and Singapore Aero Engine Services that was opened last year. And these, will create, these projects will create good manufacturing jobs. And SMEs will benefit, and so will workers. Because through these research collaborations, they will get access to the new technologies. So there are many possibilities for us to grow our economy and to reinvent and redevelop Singapore. But growth alone is not enough. Individual Singaporeans must see progress in their lives, must feel that their future is bright, and must know that each one of us has our stake in it. And this means sharing growth widely and equitably to improve the lives of all Singaporeans. It also means fully maximizing the talents and efforts of our people and getting the most capable and reliable people into the most consequential jobs where they can make the most difference and the greatest contribution. In other words, making sure there's social mobility so that our meritocracy continues to work. How do we know if our meritocracy is working? Well, first of all, every child must have a good start in life, regardless of which family you were born into. Secondly, every talent has to be recognized and developed to the fullest. Thirdly, every opportunity has to be open to anyone with the right attitude and ability. And finally, a capable person must face minimal social impediments. Minimal social impediments to being accepted, to contribute, to be in a position to lead in society. And in the long term, this last part, keeping the social impediments down, is the most difficult to sustain. We want Singapore society to maintain an informal and egalitarian tone where people interact freely and comfortably as equals, and there are no rigid class distinctions or barriers that keep good people down. This is important, but it is beyond the government's ability to bring about alone. Society itself has to be open and permeable. Each one of us must carry those attitudes, those values, those norms, that willingness to welcome talent, welcome ability, to keep the system the way it is. Any society which has been stable for a long time tends to stratify, and it becomes less socially mobile. For example, the UK and India have long entrenched hierarchies and very fixed notions of class, or in India, caste, which they have found very difficult to overcome. Singapore is still a young country of 50 years, and notions of class and hierarchy have not yet calcified. Our social cues, our markers, our norms, they're still evolving. 
and we don't want them to evolve in the wrong direction and contribute to class divisions and rigidities. Social cues are important because they, become, they can become ways to pigeonhole or to exclude others, knowingly or unknowingly. In Britain, your accent, the way you speak, can define your status in society. Do you have a posh public school accent? Do you speak like a professional who's been to Oxbridge? Do you speak as a working class person with a local accent, regional accent? Do you speak Cockney twang? Then you know you come from a certain part of London and you are a certain class of person, not very high up the totem pole. So George Bernard Shaw wrote, an Englishman's way of speaking absolutely classifies him. Classifies him. It's a pun. It pigeonholes him into his social class. You listen to him, you know. Do you respect him? Do you look down on him? Do you give him orders or do you say, yes, sir? And he went on to say, absolutely classifies him. The moment he talks, he makes some other Englishman despise him. And it's true, if you don't have an upper-class accent, you're marked down straight away. And that is why Singapore schools put emphasis on teaching students who speak good English. Otherwise, those children whose parents already speak good English at home will be fine, but others will grow up at a permanent disadvantage. And without everyone being proficient speaking standard English, Singlish will become a class marker. In other words, if you can't speak proper English while well, you are down there, if you can't speak proper English, the doors open for you. And I think this would close the doors on many from less privileged families. And that's why MCI continues to have campaigns to teach people to speak proper English. There are other social markers that can signal and entrench class differences. Members may recall the recent fuss over an unauthorized secondary school social studies textbook, guidebook. It contained a table that had sweeping generalizations about people in Singapore from high and low social economic statuses, SES. For instance, supposedly, low SES speaks English, plays soccer or basketball, and eat at hawker centers, while high SES speak formal English play golf or tennis, and only eat at fine restaurants. The story went viral. Many Singaporeans were appalled, and rightly so. Luckily, it was not a guidebook approved by MOE. <laughs> Lifestyle choices can indeed become separators in society, distinguishing marks. What you eat, how you dress, where you go for holidays, what games you play, what clubs you belong to. In every society, people have ways to show who is in and who is out. You take one look at a person, or you listen to him for a moment, and you can already place him. There are distinctions in Singapore society too. But the general tone in Singapore is one of restraint. If you wear a chunky gold watch and dress flashily, instead of being impressed, people may think you are a lone shark. <laughs> and that is as it should be. We must discourage people from flaunting their social advantages. We should frown upon those who go for ostentatious displays of wealth and status, or worse, look down on others less well-off and privileged. We should emphasize our commonalities, not accentuate our differences. And so you see, if you look around the chamber, everybody informally dressed discussing serious matters of state. In any other parliamentary chamber in this part of the world, or anywhere in the world, we'd all be togged up in our Sunday best, just to show that we are somebody in society. But that's not the Singapore way. There's a further obstacle to social mobility. Elite groups 
who become closed circles, preventing outsiders from getting in. Every society has its elite. They occupy the key leadership positions in society, in government, in academia, in business, in professions, in politics. Members of the elite share similar backgrounds, interests, social spaces. They may be alumni of the same schools. They may have done business with one another. They may have worked in the same professions. They, are, they know one another. They have interacted with one another in different roles over long periods through their lives. Such networks are natural structures in society. They are useful for people to get know, to know one another, to get things done informally, to share an implicit understanding of the interests of their society, and to feel a collective sense of responsibility for the society. And such networks are an important part of our social capital. But social networks must always remain open and permeable. They must not close up. They must not form glass ceilings. It must not be difficult or impossible for others with talent or ability, but lacking the right backgrounds and connections, to be welcome into the elite group, to rise to the top, to take their rightful place and make their full contribution. If this happened, not only would social mobility be frustrated, but soon the elite group would start to only look after its own interests and fail in their duty to lead and to care for the rest of the society. And that would be disastrous for Singapore. Let me share something which Ong Kang told me recently. RI, Raffles Institution, is one of our most popular schools. I didn't go to RI, but I can tell you it's a good school. <laughs> it has a strong tradition of accepting students from diverse backgrounds, so long as they make the cut. But over the years, RI has become less diverse. The new RI principal has been putting in the effort, speaking to parents of potential students in primary schools across Singapore, to encourage them to apply to RI. To his surprise, some of the parents told him they didn't want to send their child there. Why? Not because they thought their child couldn't cope with the academic demands, but because they feared he wouldn't be able to fit in with other more well-off students. Actually, I think this fear is unfounded. Because in reality, RI students do come from varied backgrounds. And just over half of the students live in public housing, 53%. And all of the students get along confidently and comfortably. And bursaries and scholarships are readily available. So no parent needs to worry that he can't afford to send his child to RI or that his child will feel out of place. But if such a perception exists and discourages promising students from applying to the school, is not good for RI, is not good for Singapore. RI knows what it has to do in order to uphold its egalitarian tradition. MOE will work with them and other popular schools too, so that these schools never become self-perpetuating closed circles. Government policies and programs must and do support social mobility and meritocracy. We make sure the fundamentals are done well. Quality education, home ownership, and affordable health care, which improve the lives of every Singaporean. We give everyone a good education, and now we're investing heavily in preschool to give all Singaporean kids, in fact, almost babies as well, a good start in life. We have a strong social safety net with targeted assistance schemes so that those with difficulties are not left behind and forgotten. And we intervene with extra help, whether in education, housing, healthcare, or jobs training, for those who need it to enable them to take full advantage of the opportunities. 
Above all, our education system must stay open. We've set aside places in primary schools for children without affiliation to these schools, and we will do more if necessary. We are expanding opportunities for students from different schools to interact through sports, community activities, and the Outward Bound School. Last year, I visited the Outward Bound School for their 50th anniversary celebrations. I had attended the course 50 years ago. I chatted with Nicholas Concesio, who is the executive director of OBS, and I told him that when I went to OBS 50 years ago as a 15-year-old, they only took in two students per secondary school. So in a group of 130-odd, there were people from 50, 60 different schools, different language streams, very different social backgrounds. And we all had to get together because they mixed us up properly. And we went to the course together. We became good friends and came away understanding the diversity of our society better and how we could all work together. Because 17 days at that impressionable age, it's an intense experience. You are put through physically stressed, you are emotionally put to your limits, you have to work with others, there's very little that you can do alone. And if you don't make friends, you are miserable. And you have to make friends across boundaries. So I recounted this, and Nicholas told me that today, well, because of the larger numbers, they can't take in students from 60 or 70 schools at a time, but they take in students from two or three schools at a time. And nowadays, the students all speak English, but still, he finds clear differences in the cultures of, and interests of the students from the different schools, and even in the way they use language. So it's all speaking English, but different interests, different vocabulary, really different world perspectives, almost. At OBS, the students still learn to work in teams. So when they pitch a tent or build a raft or safely belay someone on an obstacle course, they must work closely with teammates. You can't do it alone. And so the students learn to bridge their differences and to trust one another. So after 50 years, OBS remains a valuable opportunity for students to mix and interact across different schools and social groups. And we will do more of this so we are building an extension of OBS on Coney Island. When that opens, even more students will benefit from this experience. So we are doing many things to improve social mobility. But I have to be honest with you, there are no easy solutions. Many societies have faced this problem. Many ideas have been proposed and tried out. Political philosophers, statesmen, all powerful human minds have been brought to bear to try to deal with this conundrum of how to keep your society spry, open, stable. And there have been no magic bullets. There have been varying degrees of success. And the most successful models, perhaps, are the Scandinavian countries, but even they have seen widening social inequality in recent times. So we have to understand that this is what they call a wicked problem. It's a problem with no easy solution, which we will discuss rightly, repeatedly, in this house through the years. Our strategy in Singapore has been more successful than most, with universal education, with home ownership, with the government's determination to widen opportunities and make the most of every citizen We've made meritocracy work in Singapore. And now that our society is more settled, we must work harder to keep the pathways open and to level people up. The government is not ideological. We are pragmatic. We will try anything which works. We will learn from our own experience and the experience of others. But we must also be realistic. Spot what looks promising but please also recognize what will not work. 
Some people have suggested, I read in the newspapers, a universal basic income, which is a neat idea so far unproven anywhere in the world. The Finns tried it and aborted the experiment early. It didn't work for them. Others want to abolish the PSLE. That is, in fact, very hard to do. Educators have very different views, and even parents have very different views. Whether it's PSLE, you'd be better off without a PSLE. But we are taking the first steps to change the status quo by doing away with T-scores. And if anyone can come up with a better alternative, certainly we will consider it. In the end, the government must focus on practical, effective policies. As a society, we must uphold clear social norms that minimize social barriers and encourage mobility so as to keep our meritocratic system working well for all Singaporeans. Meritocracy is about individuals having opportunities and being successful. But we must also be successful together as one people, one society, and one nation. Not just successful alone, but successful together. And that's what social cohesion is about. We must feel a sense of social responsibility and concern for our fellow citizens, without which our society cannot hold together. What holds us together is not our pink NRICs, but the shared experiences that we build together over time. We grow up together in national schools. We are comfortable around each other, regardless of our family backgrounds. We go through national service, building brotherhood and camaraderie when we march and fight together. We eat at hawker centres, regardless whether we are rich and poor, so the guidebook is wrong. We live in HDB estates. We learn the habits and preferences of different races and religions. And we help neighbours out when they are in need. We travel together on public transport. And unlike in some other countries, there's no social stigma to living in public housing or taking the bus or the train. We celebrate our successes together, such as SG50 recently and every national day. And when crisis hit, we go through them side by side. We've made much progress in our nation building. We are now much more cohesive than 50 years ago, when we didn't live in integrated HDB estates, townships, nor did we do NS together. Or even 20 years ago, before 9-11 and before SARS. But nation building will always be a work in progress because the forces that pull Singaporeans in different directions never go away. Race, language, and religion are enduring fault lines. From the start, we knew they could divide and destroy us. Today, our social cohesion has grown stronger, but these tidal pulls have grown stronger too. Take, for example, the influence of China and India on our own ethnic groups, on Singaporean Indians and Chinese Singaporeans and Indian Singaporeans. These are two vast nations, even civilizations. They are growing in strength and confidence. It will be a very long time before we, are, we become immune to their ethnic, cultural, or economic pulls. Furthermore, the relationship is complicated because, on the one hand, we want to maintain our separate identity as a multiracial, sovereign, independent country. But on the other hand, we want to say we speak Mandarin, we have overseas Indians, we have ethnic links, we have cultural ties, we have an inside track. So between the two, there's a tension, and we have to keep that balance and maintain our position and our cohesion. Likewise with the Malays. Over time, a Singaporean Malay identity has emerged clearly, but still it overlaps with the Malays in Malaysia, both in terms of race as well as religion. 
and the call for a global Ummah, a community of the Muslims around the world, has powerful appeal. Furthermore, we are exposed in this internet age to extremist and exclusivist teachings. These can lead individuals astray, and if there's a terrorist attack, it will cause great fear and distrust between Muslims and other Singaporeans. Beyond race, language, and religion, we must work at building bridges between different groups and in society. Traditionally, when we talk about social cohesion, we think of race, language, and religion. But if we look at it in other dimensions, there are other gradients, other possible fault lines, other ways where we have to strengthen our social cohesion and become closer together. One of them is between unions and management. Another one is between old citizens and new. The labor movement is one institution vital to our social cohesion. Because of the tripartite partnership, labor management relations are a source of strength for us. Unlike in many other countries where unions and managements are bitterly opposed. Whereas in Singapore, labor harmony is secured with the help of a strong NTUC, <laughs> as we sing at every May Day rally, slightly out of tune. <laughs> but in the new economy, fewer workers are doing jobs traditionally covered by the trade unions, and many more are freelancers and professionals. So if these new groups are left out and union coverage shrinks as a result of the changing workforce composition, and you have more people who are not represented, not taken care of, don't feel protected, and look for other solutions, it would weaken tripartism and our social compact. So it's better for the labor movement to embrace them, to adopt their concerns, to become more inclusive. And that's what Chan Chun Singh did in NTUC, widening the labor movement membership beyond trade unions to include NTUC U associates, the PMETs and the freelancers. And now Ng Chi Meng in NTUC will carry on his work. Another bridge we need to build is to our new citizens. Immigrants are part and parcel of our history and our identity. And if you look ahead, we need a steady flow of immigrants. Not too many, not too few, just right, to top up our population. First generation immigrants into any country will always take time to settle down, to understand the nuances of the culture and character, to progressively integrate into the society. And that's what happens in the past with previous waves of first generation Singaporeans over the last 200 years, and that is a necessary process which has to happen as we continue to have an inflow of people to join us and become Singapore citizens. The new arrivals have chosen to make Singapore their home, and they will contribute to our country, our society. They have to make every effort to mix and to interact with everyone else. For our part, we should welcome them, we should support them in their journey to become Singaporeans, as others have helped our forefathers and helped ourselves. Therefore, there's much work to do to maintain our social cohesion. Mr. Speaker, sir, these are the challenges for the next generation of leaders. To continue to grow Singapore, reinventing our economy, creating new possibilities for the future. To ensure that Singapore is always a land of opportunity, a meritocratic, fair and just society. To hold Singaporeans together in one cohesive society. Can the next generation of leaders build on our shared experiences of 50 years and maintain the sense of collective mission? Can they work to improve the lives of Singaporeans and not the lives of all Singaporeans and not the interests of narrow groups 
so that they pass on an even stronger and more united Singapore? I think they can. The 4G team is now in place. They are overseeing their own portfolios and projects. They are explaining their ideas to Singaporeans. They are implementing policies and making them work. Many of them joined in the last three general elections from 2006 onwards, so about over the last 12 years. I have also promoted promising backbenchers to become office holders, including in the recent reshuffle. It's a strong team of able men and women with a balanced combination of skills and strengths. They are gaining experience, they are willing to serve, and most importantly, their hearts are in the right place. We need new leaders for each generation, from each generation. Because each generation has its own challenges to tackle and tough choices to make. The electorate will be different, the economic landscape will be different, the international order may well also be different. Some hard truths will always remain for Singapore. But even old problems may need new solutions. We must be pragmatic and not ideological in our approach. Keep an open mind and make decisions both with the head and the heart. Remember our history, but don't be trapped by it. And that's why leadership renewal is crucial. New ideas, new bonds, and new connections are needed with every new generation. Last week at the reopening of Parliament, I had a chance to chat with Mr. Lo Tia Kiang. Somebody snapped a picture of us, and the Workers' Party posted a smiling photo of two of us on their Facebook page. It was a nice picture. What were we talking about? I think Mr. Lo won't mind me sharing. I asked him. The Workers' Party is having a leadership transition too. What will change now that the WP has a new leader? And he replied, nothing much. We, the WP, have our role. These things should not change suddenly. Don't you agree? I agreed with Mr. Lowe. As an opposition party, the Workers' Party plays a role in our political system, whoever is their party leader. <coughs> opposition parties keep Singapore politics contestable. In other words, the ruling party, the PAP, does not have a monopoly of power, does not have the right to rule Singapore indefinitely. So long as the PAP government performs, it keeps the voters' support, it stays in power, and the opposition cannot gain ground. But if the PAP government becomes incompetent or corrupt, then, of course, the opposition will grow. <coughs> so our system gives the PAP government gives any government every incentive to perform and to keep the opposition performing its role where it is, namely in the opposition. The PAP is determined to perform. We treat every election as a serious contest. We take every debate in the House seriously. And that's why we amended the Constitution to ensure that there will be always at least 12 opposition and NCMPs in the House, whatever the outcome of the general election. Political parties do not have a fixed lifespan, a time to live and a time to die, as Ecclesiastes might put it. How long a political party continues in government, or in opposition for that matter, because parties come and go in opposition too, depends whether it can renew itself, continue to serve the people, continue to bring progress to the nation. If the PAP can keep on successfully doing that, we can stay in government. But if we ever fail, we deserve to lose. So my message to all PAP MPs is, work hard, serve the people, hold the ground, win the elections. This doesn't mean the government will shy away from difficult problems. A government must govern, must govern. And if ministers are not prepared to govern, then give it up. Because that's 
your duty, that's what you're here for. And governing means that from time to time, you have to do difficult things when they become necessary. Leadership means that you've got to explain, persuade, convince people that you know what you're doing and that you're doing it for a good reason and it's the right thing to do. That's the way to maintain people's trust. And trust is crucial. Take taxes. In the recent Malaysian election, one hot issue was their GST. The previous government had introduced a new GST tax three years ago, and it had caused great unhappiness in Malaysia. After Pakatan Harapan won the election, Dr. Mahathir announced that his new government would abolish the GST. Why did this happen? It wasn't because of the economic merits or demerits of the GST. From the economic point of view, the GST is better than the sales tax that it replaced. But politically, Malaysians linked the GST with other complaints they had with, that, with the previous government, and they rejected the explanations and the persuasions, and they said, no, I don't accept this, out with it. Does that mean that no government sh should ever raise taxes? Alas, that's not the real world. From time to time, the country will need to spend more on health care, on defence, on education, or something else. And if revenues are not enough, it will have no choice but to raise taxes. Then the government must convince the population that it is raising taxes for a good reason, for the right reason. And whether the voters accept that will depend not just on the arguments, but also, crucially, on whether they trust the government. Because with the arguments, for every right argument, you can produce five doubtful ones which look quite plausible. And during elections, there's no shortage of producers of such arguments. And people can get confused. Finally, they have to decide whom do they trust, what is their track record, do you want to put your future, your fate, your children's future in the hands of this team and believe that they have your best interests at heart. And if you do, you vote for them and you take all the things which need to be done as one bundle. Finally, voters have to trust the government to do the right thing on their behalf, even when it is painful. I think this is the right lesson to learn. Without trust, the government can't govern. It wouldn't dare to do painful but necessary things. And politics becomes the art of pandering, a bidding war between the parties. Who can give more? Who can offer more? You say you reduce the tax. I say I abolish the tax. Then you say I will give you a hong pao on top of that. And how to pay? Well, we can think about that after the elections. And the country goes downhill. The 4G ministers understand this. They've been working together, learning to complement one another's strengths and weaknesses, making decisions as a team, and taking collective responsibility for these decisions. To me, this working together is as important, if not more important, than the question of who will be the next PM. Because for the next PM, I know there's more than one qualified candidate. We are fortunate that this is so because it provides strength and depth to the team. Now it's about the team coming to a consensus on the best option. But to work together as a team, that is not a choice because there's no other option. Whoever becomes the next PM, the team has to work closely together for him to succeed. And if they cannot or do not do so, then the next PM will fail, whoever he is. Even in the best of times, and certainly in times of severe crisis, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew did not run the country by himself. Neither did Mr. Go Chok Tong, nor myself. When Mr. Lee 
One year, Mr. Lee received the freedom of the City of London. In 1982, it was a grand occasion. They dressed up, he made a speech. He said, I feel like a conductor at a concert, bowing to applause, but unable to turn around and invite the accomplished musicians in his orchestra to rise and receive the ovation for the music they have played. For running a government is not unlike running an orchestra, and no Prime Minister ever achieves much without an able team of players. I think I can speak for Mr. Mr. Gojok Tong when I say that we both feel the same way. All three of us were not sole leaders, but primus inter pares. That means first amongst equals, but the emphasis is we are equals, but you're just the first amongst equals. First amongst equals with our colleagues. We take their views, we take them seriously, we benefit from their advice and their abilities and their skills. We have fierce arguments as to what to do, but we are on a strong, on a team together with strong enough bonds that we can deal with issues together. And there is leadership, but it is unforced. It has to be unforced leadership. The team accepts, respects, and knows that it has an important role to play. They are not there just to carry out orders. We were all fortunate. Singapore was fortunate that the PMs had such stalwart colleagues. Mr. Lee had a core team, very strong ministers supporting him. Go Keng Sui, S. Rajaratnam, Lim Kim San, Hon Sui Sen, Osman Wok. ESM Go had a talented team too. Ong Ting Chiong, Tony Tan, Wong Kan Seng, Jaya Kumar, Dana Balan, Abdullah Tamuji, George Yeo, just to name a few. If anything, ESM Go's team was even more comprehensive than Mr. Lee's. And when I took over as Prime Minister, I inherited ESM Go's strong team. And Mr. Go himself stayed on, and we added talent to his team. Now he stepped down, I rely on my own core team, which now also includes several of the 4G ministers. So the next PM must have and will have his own stalwart colleagues too. His generation, and I hope also younger ones. I know everyone is anxious to know who the next PM will be. Well, the leader must command the respect and loyalty of his whole team. He must enjoy the support and confidence of the broad mass of Singaporeans. And these things take time. They cannot be forced. I do not believe we are ready to settle on a choice yet. Nor is it helpful to treat this either as a horse race or a campaign to lobby support for one or the other candidate. This is a team game. We want a strong, cohesive team so that Team Singapore is the winner. I have just reshuffled the cabinet. I've moved some ministers to new portfolios. I've expanded the responsibilities of others. The 4G ministers now helm two-thirds of the ministries. They have a major say in policies and the direction to take Singapore. Let's give them the time and space to do their own work, to work together in their new roles, and to get better known by the public. I'm confident that in the fullness of time, we will see a clear outcome and a leader will emerge from the process. Certainly, I expect this to happen before the next general election. For these 14 years as PM, I have been working with a 4G team, guiding them, assessing them, preparing them to take over the reins. When Heng Sui Kiat rounded up the budget debate this year, I was happy to hear him describe the budget as one that not only meets the needs of today's generation, but also accounts for the needs of future generations. 
It showed that the 4G ministers understood that their deepest responsibility is to be a steward of Singapore. What does it mean, steward? The government is certainly not the owner of Singapore, but neither is it just the manager of Singapore. It is the steward. It's responsible for taking good care of the country, for holding it in trust, building it up, and handing it on in due time to future generations. The government must keep faith with past generations who gifted this country to us. It has to be responsible to the present generation who continue to build on what we have inherited. But above all, it must consider future generations whose lives and whose futures depend on us, on us, the present generation. Depend on us thinking of their interests, acting on their behalf, making wise and far-sighted decisions to cause Singapore to endure and to flourish for many more years. I'm confident that when the time comes for me to hand over to a new Prime Minister, Singapore will be put into the hands of good stewards. We've built something truly special here in Singapore. Countries near and far look to Singapore as a model of governance and development. People want to live here, do business here. Even the US and the DPRK are planning to hold their meeting here. In many other countries, political leaders plan only up to the next election or the next crisis. But in Singapore, we are able to think beyond the immediate, beyond ourselves. We care about our community, our country, and our future. Our religious leaders, they visit temples, churches, mosques together. They give blessings on one another's milestone celebrations. Our neighbors and friends invite us over for makan during Chinese New Year, Deepavali, or Hari Raya. Our youth travel and experience the world. They come back eager to apply what they have seen and learned around the world back home. Our grandparents and our parents bring us up and nurture us. They are living examples of how, by working hard, we can build better lives for ourselves and our children. So we are all living the Singapore story, keeping it alive. We must sustain and pass on this shared vision of prospering together, progressing together. That way, we will make this little red dot shine bright in the world as well as in our hearts for many, many years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Lo Tia Kiang. Speaker, sir, I would like to seek a clarification from the Prime Minister. Um, given that the 4G leadership, especially the three front runners for the next prime ministers, largely come from the SAF or the civil service. Does it not a sign that there is now a political elite class in Singapore? Mr. Speaker, sir, this is an example of the way not to think about the problem. When you look at the person, you ask, is he making a contribution? What are his strengths and weaknesses? What are his contributions? Does he or does he not measure up? You don't ask, where did he come from, who his parents are? Is it bad to come from the civil service or the SAF? No. Is it necessary to come from there? No. Is it good to have people from a wide range? Yes, and we do have a wide range. He talked about three front runners. I don't know how many people are running. I just said it's not a horse race. It's a team. I have people from the private sector. I have doctors. I have lawyers. I have brought in new people from the backbenches, some of whom also from the private sector, business experience. So we are looking for people wherever we can find them to bring in to form a Singapore team. 
And the stronger this team is, the harder I make Mr. Lowe's job. <laughs> and I can't help it. It wasn't my objective. I just want the best team for Singapore.